All right. Good afternoon and welcome to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, uh, today uh, we have Dr. Aju Matthew, who's uh, one of our new faculty members from the Division of Oncology, speaking about bisphosphonates and breast cancer, a triple threat. The objectives for today are to review the indications for the use of bisphosphonates in breast cancer, to identify the adverse effects of bisphosphonates in breast cancer therapy, and to discuss the anti-tumor effect of bisphosphonates in breast cancer therapy. Um, he has no financial disclosures. Fellows and faculty, to claim CME credit, grab one of the flyers on the way out, with, which gives you the instructions. And the deadline is January 6, 2015. Um, and uh, with that, I'll welcome Dr. Manchu, or Matthew to the podium. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Let's get started with the talk. And if you have any questions, please raise your hands and we can just take the questions as it comes. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Over the next 45 minutes, I intend to outline the indications for use of bisphosphonates in breast cancer. We will briefly review the various adverse effects of bisphosphonate therapy and I will discuss an, uh, the anti-tumor effects of bisphosphonates or possibly the anti-cancer effect. So why am I talking about breast cancer today? Of course it's important for my job but why should you know about it? Because it is the leading um, cancer in women. In fact, uh, in 2014, nearly 230,000 cancers were diagnosed. And in fact, it is the second leading cause of cancer death in women, about 40,000 deaths in women. So what we are trying to do in our CBCC, that's our comprehensive breast care clinic, is to make an impact on these numbers. And increasingly, we're realizing that what we treat is not just breast cancer, but we treat several kinds of breast cancers. And in helping us treat breast cancers, we depend on tumor biology to drive or the, way we, we, the way we manage cancers. And our goal is to provide a more tailored, individualized approach. You may have heard of the term precision medicine or uh, personalized medicine. That's exactly what we intend to deliver to our patients in one way or the other. It has been broadly meant to be meaning uh, genetic testing, but more importantly, it's personalized care understanding the specific patient and administering care for that particular patient. Let's address a patient's um, case and take this topic forward. Mrs. S is a 58-year-old woman with right-sided breast cancer, stage 3, PT2N2, who comes to your clinic to establish care. She declined chemotherapy. She has ER-positive disease, in other words, hormone-responsive disease. Now, what would you recommend as an adjuvant management strategy? Show of hands, maybe? I don't have clickers. Tamoxifen? None. Okay. Anastrozole. That's B. Okay. Anastrozole and tamoxifen, a more complete strategy, the, probably the best. No. Bisphosphonates. Okay, I'm here because of the topic, right? So it should be the answer. Please. No? Okay. And E, B and D. Well, good, good. I'm, I'm glad you recognize that I'm talking about independent, an, an important topic, but I don't think that's the answer that's uh, generally recognized. The answer is B, which is an astrozole, but we'll go through why I think E is also important. Let's just review the mechanism of estrogen action in breast cancer cells. Uh, in our body, we have androstenedione dione and testosterone, that's man and women. And aromatase is the enzyme that helps convert it into the more biologically important estradiol. That's uh, in the middle. I don't think I do. You, okay, there you go. Estradiol. And it acts on the estrogen receptor, causing nuclear transcription and cell proliferation and other uh, estrogen mediated effects in the cell. Some of the options in our questions, tamoxifen for that matter, works on the estrogen receptor. It's an ER antagonist, but it has positive effects. ER agonist effect on the bones, so it's good for bones. Aromatase inhibitors work by inhibiting the aromatase enzyme, thereby you do not get peripheral circulating estrogen in your body. 
So essentially, there's nothing to act on the estrogen receptor and nothing to feed a breast cancer cell, which is hormone responsive. Often women come to me uh, in clinic, uh, postmenopausal women, or patients who've had oophorectomy, and ask me, why do I need endocrine therapy? I don't have any estrogen. I get hot flashes even now. There's no, uh, there's no ovaries in our body. Why do I need aromatase inhibitors, or tamoxifen, any treatment? Well, the answer to that question is very simple. In postmenopausal women, or in women who've had uh, oophorectomy, their main source of estrogen in the body is from either the muscle, the adipose tissue, or from the liver. So, in fact, um, ER positive breast cancer patients, the cell, the estrogen sensitive cells, require just tiny bits of estrogen for their growth. So, even the tiny amounts of estrogen that are produced from these non ovary sources are very important for breast cancer. And how do we know aromatase inhibitors work? How does it compare with the standard of care that was in use for several years, tamoxifen? A large meta-analysis was published just a few months ago. Uh, IPD meta-analysis for medical students here in the crowd, it means uh, you're trying to pool each patient's information from various trials and analyze them together as one single trial, in other words, and thereby you get more power to detect minor effects, more power to do subgroup analysis. So this individual participant data meta-analysis looked at aromatase inhibitor use versus tamoxifen use for five years in patients who had early stage breast cancer, and over the course of 10 years, nearly 14.2 percentage of women had death because of breast cancer when they were on tamoxifen as compared to 12.1 percentage of women who were on anastrozole, letrozole, or eczemestane. Those are the three kinds of aromatase inhibitors we use these days. So what does that mean? Uh, aromatase inhibitors does work and actually works better than tamoxifen in women who have postmenopausal breast cancer. You see a definite improvement in breast cancer mortality even past the five-year mark. They stop taking it at the five-year mark, but the effect lasts even more. But of course, it's nothing that we do is without any effects, right? I mean, we give some stuff to patients. It's not water, so it does have some side effects. So what are the side effects of aromatase inhibitor therapy? It's primarily due to the estrogen depletion. So if you look at postmenopausal women, their estrogen levels drop gradually, but once we start using aromatase inhibitors, there's a rapid reduction in the estrogen levels. And that translates to bone loss. As compared to postmenopausal women, an annual bone mineral density loss is probably more than two times in patients with breast cancer who are on aromatase inhibitors. Why does that matter? Because we are trying to avoid fractures in these women. We are treating them for breast cancer, they're probably already cured. Why should we give them an additional fracture to take care of? Patients who are osteopenic have about a 2%, two times risk for fractures, but once you get into the osteoporotic range, their fracture risk doubles, triples, and actually runs to more than 16 times in significantly osteoporotic women. But this nice study looked at the number of women with fractures and the fracture rate across a spectrum of bone mineral density that extends from normal bone mineral density to osteopenia to osteoporosis. And we found that fracture rate increases about two-fold in osteopenic women as compared to normal. But if you look at the absolute number of fractures that's happening, just the, there is a majority of the fractures occur in the osteopenic women. That's women who are not given any therapy for osteoporosis. They are uh, those who have a BMD T-score of minus 1 and minus 2.5. So we know that AI, that's anastrozole, letrozole, or eczemestane, drop bone mineral density and causes fractures probably. And how do we know that? These are various trials that looked at AI versus either tamoxifen or placebo. The yellow is tamoxifen, the red is anastrozole, green is um, eczemestane, that's another AI, uh, and the red is letrozole. As compared to the control arm, 
AI therapy increases the fracture rate in women with early stage breast cancer. So given this information, Mrs. S decided to start letrozole therapy. A baseline bone density scan was performed and lumbar spine T score was minus 1.8. What does that mean? Patient has osteopenia. Now how will you manage your osteopenia? Show of hands again. I'll let you read all the options so that you're not biased to answer E this time. All right, have everybody made up their mind? Okay. Option A, calcium and vitamin D. Okay, a few of you. Alendronate weekly, that's Fosamax, okay. Zolidronate every six months intravenously, okay. Observation, do nothing, okay. And A, uh, as well as B or C, that's calcium plus bisphosphonate. So uh, again, there is no standard, there's no definite answer, but the answer if you're taking this for a board exam is actually A, which is calcium and vitamin D. Osteopenia, there's no clear indication to start. Bisphosphonate, especially this is a baseline DEXA scan. You know, you're not actually monitoring them and seeing that it's actually getting worse. Sometimes calcium and vitamin D can stop bone loss. Uh, but I'm arguing that probably we should start thinking about bisphosphonate use in these women with osteopenia. So let's talk about aromatase inhibitor therapy induced bone loss and how we manage it. But before that, let's just do a brief uh, overview of bisphosphonates. There are two kinds of bisphosphonates. It's non-nitrogen bisphosphonate and amino bisphosphonate or nitrogen bisphosphonates. Clodronate is one of the non-nitrogen bisphosphonates that uh, has been used in our institution using a clinical trial that we ran at our CVCC. The other uh, more familiar options are alendronate, Fosamax, and zolidronate. These are the ones that uh, are increasingly used in, uh, in the United States. And how does it uh, work? So if you give zolidronic acid, these are drugs that act on osteoclasts and inhibit osteoclasts. So essentially you're cutting down osteoclastogenesis and thereby uh, by causing apoptosis, basically inhibiting bone uh, loss. When zolidronic acid was given to women, um, if compared to placebo, it improved bone mineral density. So what do you do when you have this information that bisphosphonate improved bone mineral density in breast cancer patients? You conduct clinical trials. So several clinical trials were conducted, few in premenopausal women and postmenopausal women. I'll just give you a quick overview of some of these trials and what uh, these trials showed. The ABCSG12 trial was conducted in Germany. This was a two by two factorial trial, basically trying to answer two questions at the same time. Premenopausal women received tamoxifen versus anastrozole or zolidronic acid versus nothing. So there was four groups of women. All of them got their ovarian function suppressed by using gosarelin, that's a GnRH analog. And uh, some women received tamoxifen plus zomeda, zolidronic acid, some just tamoxifen, some anastrozole plus zomeda, some anastrozole. This is baseline. Um, at time zero is baseline bone density. Red is normal bones, blue is osteopenia, and yellow is osteoporosis. In patients who are on just anastrozole, as compared to patients who are on anastrozole plus zoldronic acid, the baseline looks similar, right? But as time progresses, we see that more and more women became osteopenic, more and more women became osteoporotic if they are on an aromatase inhibitor, like we talked about before. But once we give them zoldronic acid, we're sort of maintaining their bone mineral density at time three year period. So zoldronic acid preserved bone mineral density in women who were on AI therapy. The other trials which were conducted in postmenopausal women had a similar design. These were patients who were postmenopausal, early stage breast cancer, and they received um, either upfront zoldronic acid that I see them in clinic, I start them in zoldronic acid, that's option number one, that's here, upfront, when I give them letrozole. The other option is I monitor their bone mineral density and once it drops, once I see that they become osteopenic, then I give them uh, the patient's zoldronic acid. That's, that's a delayed strategy. What do we find? As compared to upfront zoldronic acid use, as time goes by, this is the reddest delayed use, 
there is at least a 7% difference in bone mineral density in lumbar spine. And in total, in hip, there's at least a 5% difference in bone mineral density with upfront use. But at least delayed use, uh, you know, is probably better than placebo anyway. But this was basically looking at a strategy of using it upfront versus delayed. We talk about maintaining the bone mineral density, but does it actually translate into reduction of fractures? That's the important question, right? I mean, we need hard outcomes. You don't just need, okay, I see that bone mineral density is maintained or actually it gets better, but we need to actually look at fractures. None of these trials are powered to look at fracture. So what do you do when trials are not powered, but they have a similar design? You conduct another meta-analysis. So there you go, another meta-analysis of 13,000 women who were on bisphosphonates. They looked over the course of time, and 6.3% had fractures when they were on bisphosphonates as compared to 7.3%, statistically significant. So theoretically, bisphosphonates improve bone mineral density in patients who were on AI therapy, and theoretically, and as you can see from this meta-analysis, it improves fracture rate as well. So right now, our guidelines, or the way we think is, if a patient is started on bisphosphonates, oh, I'm sorry, if a patient is started on AI, early stage breast cancer, we look at bone density. If they have normal DEXA or no risk factors, calcium and vitamin D, and we monitor their bone density every two years. But if they have osteopenia or osteoporosis and other, or other risk factors, we think about either zoldronic acid or some other agents like alendronate. Uh, on a weekly basis, along with calcium and vitamin D supplements, and monitor BMD every two-year interval. So the first indication is it helps prevent bone loss associated with AI therapy. It's important to do baseline assessment and regular assessment, and upfront use is probably ideal, but monitor and then use if necessary is also prudent. It may prevent the incidence of uh, clinical fractures. Actually, yeah, I, I should correct this. It does prevent the incidence of clinical fractures. Okay, so Ms. S uh, now has decided to start this phosphonate therapy, but she has a question for you. I want to know what my side effects are. What, what would you recommend? What would you mention to her about the side effects of this phosphonate therapy? Again, I'll give you five seconds to think. Okay, fever? None. Arthritis? None. Renal stones. TMJ arthritis, that's over here. Okay. Hypercalcemia. Okay. Well, it looks like everybody is neutral. Nobody wants to answer. That's fine. All right. That's okay. I, I do this all the time, and I come for grand rounds too. I don't answer, so it's okay. <laughs> so what are the adverse effects of bisphosphonates? Acute reaction. Um, my nurses are here. The, the, my bosses, actually. The entire CBCC team is here. They would know better than I do how much bisphosphonates can cause all these fever, arthralgia, flu-like syndromes, myalgia, etc. So acute reaction. Renal insufficiency, it can cause a little bit of drop of renal uh, function. The more dreaded side effect, as uh, Mary, my medical student just told me yesterday, is abscess of the bone, osteonecrosis of the jaw. That's what comes into everybody's mind the moment you hear bisphosphonates. Hypocalcemia is important. So which is the right answer? The answer is fever. It does not cause arthritis, maybe arthralgias does not cause renal stones. It causes ONJ, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and it causes hypocalcemia. Contraindications, don't give this in hypocalcemic patients. Don't give this therapy in patients who have renal insufficiency. All right, osteonecrosis of the jaw. You hear about it all the time. What does it really mean? It means uh, it's an area of exposed bone that persists for more than eight weeks. What are the symptoms? Pain, swelling, numbness, and obviously exposed bone sometimes. How do you manage? It's almost always conservative. Rarely they have to undergo any surgery. Con what do you mean by conservative strategy? Oral mouthwash, antibiotics, does the trick. What are the, what's the incidence of uh, bisphosphonate-induced uh, ONJ? Some of the trials, the earlier trials showed 1 to 1.8, 2 percentage as the incidence of ONJ. But you should know that these higher incidence of ONJ was seen in these earlier trials when, when physicians, oncologists did not know how to manage uh, or how to monitor for bisphosphonate therapy. Now we screen patients 
uh, in terms of their dental history, in terms of uh, we monitor uh, a careful oral exam. So the incidence of uh, ONJ is much fewer than what these earlier trials uh, showed. And some of the pictures that you see in uh, clinical images in our journals are the worst cases. You don't get there. You sort of know when they start experiencing symptoms of numbness in their jaw, some pain and stop therapy at that instance and conservative management helps reverse uh, ONJ. All right, so now that I've uh, uh, reviewed the indications, let's talk about another patient who came to my clinic, Mrs. M. Uh, she's a 62-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer to the bone, and she came, comes to your office. Based on the current guidelines, so she has metastatic disease in the bones, and therefore uh, you have started her on bisphosphonates. Which of the following conditions are you trying to prevent using this therapy? A, pathologic fractures, B, hypercalcemia, C, spinal cord compression, and D, all of the above. Start with A, pathologic fractures, B, hypercalcemia, C, spinal cord compression, and D, all of the above. All right, resounding, resounding success. All right, let's review the bone complications in metastatic breast cancer. When you have metastatic disease in the bones, whether be it from breast cancer or from whatever cancer, you have a lot of skeletal related complications. What are those complications that you think of? They're basically several pathologic fractures when patients just fracture without actually having any trauma. When they have any indications to receiving radiation therapy to the bone or they have a surgery to the bone, that means they have something happening that requires an intervention. It's a skeletal related event. Spinal cord compression almost always happens as a result of bone metastatic disease or hypercalcemia of malignancy because of the, the, the significant bone metastatic burden of disease. And what can you do to these patients when they have metastatic disease in the bones? These are a few trials that looked at pamidronic acid versus placebo or isoldronic acid versus placebo. When you use bisphosphonates, you're sort of delaying the time to the first skeletal related events, so essentially protecting a patient's bones. Again, doubling the time to first metastatic disease, de delaying fractures, improving the skeletal morbidity rate. So several trials have looked at and confirmed that patients who have metastatic disease in the bones, bisphosphonates are a crucial part of therapeutic strategy in these patients. It helps delay, prevent, or treat skeletal metastatic disease. So that's number two, indication number two for bisphosphonate use in breast cancer patients in metastatic breast cancer patients with disease in the bones. All right, so Mrs. S, let's go back to Mrs. S. That's my other patient with the early stage breast cancer who's on letrozole, who's on bisphosphonates, okay? Because she has osteopenia. Now she started taking zoldronic acid shots for the management of osteopenia, okay? After six months, she is back in my clinic for the next dose. And she asked me this very, uh, uh, innocent, naive question, which could be a loaded question at times. Does it help fight cancer, doctor? What do you reply? A, it does not have any anti-cancer effects. B, it has anti-cancer effect. C, it may have anti-cancer effect. And D, it can cause cancer. A, and B, C, all right, good, nice. D, it can cause cancer. All right, now. Okay, let's review the anti-cancer effects or possible effects of bisphosphonates. Let me take you back to the ancient days, 1889. This was when Dr. Pidget of the famous Pidget's disease wrote this nice perspective article in Lancet. He said that while many researchers have been studying the seed, that's the cancer cell, the properties of the soil may reveal invaluable insights into the metastatic peculiarities in cancer case. So he framed what we now call the seed and the soil hypothesis. What is a soil in breast cancer? This is a ma malignant neoplasm as is the dogma for all malignant tumors. They are very prone with angiogenesis, new vessel formation. And these tumors, these cancer cells invade, they embolize, extravasates, and tries to find a soil, essentially a microenvironment where it can settle down and grow. And it finds a soil in the bone and you get 
bone metastasis. In fact, 85% of our breast cancer patients who have metastatic disease have bone metastasis. And we've noticed that it is the most common first site of metastatic disease in breast cancer patients. How does bisphosphonate work in this instance? Bisphosphonates inhibit osteoclast by inhibiting apoptosis. And not only that, it actually modulates the effects of osteoblast. Sometimes osteoblast signals to the osteoclast, so it inhibits those signals. And therefore, it prevents osteoclasts from causing more bone destruction uh, at uh, the site of osteoclastogenesis. So bisphosphonates basically work on, in this uh, microenvironment. When you have this information that you know, soil is important, microenvironment is important, and bisphosphonates probably has some role in helping strengthen bones or actually altering the microenvironment, what do you do next? Let's launch large multicenter trials, right? So that's indeed the, what we've done. We, we launched large trials, and some of these were not powered to look at this question. And let me review some of the results from these trials. Going back to the trial that I mentioned earlier, which actually showed that nice graph showing upfront use was better compared to delayed use. Those trials also evaluated some of the disease-specific outcomes as a secondary endpoint, disease-free survival endpoints. In patients who had upfront use of zaldonic acid as compared to delayed use at 36 months, 3% uh, of these patients had disease recurrence as compared to 5.3 percentage. There was no uh, statistically significant result, but there, clearly there's a trend in the ZFAST trial that patients who got zaldronic acid upfront had lesser incidence of, uh, fewer incidence of uh, disease uh, recurrence. The ZOFAST trial, these are all named the same because it's all done by the same company except that it's all done in different continents because of drug approval process. The ZOFAST trial looked at the same uh, disease-free survival as a secondary endpoint and in an intention to treat population it did find a significant improvement in disease-free survival rates in patients who got upfront zoldronic acid therapy. That's uh, noted even in censored analysis. So again, another trial was launched exclusively to study the effect of adjuvant bisphosphonate therapy in terms of preventing disease recurrence. This is a large study conducted in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's called uh, ASIO trial. It looked at 3,300 patients who had early stage breast cancer. It included both premenopausal and postmenopausal women. Patients got zoldronic acid in an intensive schedule for the first few months and in a more relaxed, less intensive schedule for five years. They looked at disease surveillance outcomes. The study results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Overall survival results did not show a benefit with zoldronic acid use as compared to control use in early stage breast cancer patients. Not, no effect. But when they did subgroup analysis, this was not a pre-specified subgroup analysis. This was done um, trying to fish for positive results, but they did find something. In premenopausal, perimenopausal women, there was no, was no difference. The line essentially merges. And in women who are postmenopausal, or uh, older women, when you use zoldronic acid, you sort of prevent uh, breast cancer from returning in about uh, 20, it's a reduction of about 29 percentage. That's in postmenopausal women. And the effects were independent of ER status. So that's as your trial. Another trial in Germany now looked at exclusively in premenopausal women. We talked about this trial earlier. But this is again in a, the same trial reviewing uh, disease surveillance outcomes in a, uh, in a secondary endpoint setting. This is the factorial trial that I was talking about. Premenopausal women who are made menopausal, who have been suppressed uh, using gosorelin. So these are premenopausal, but they don't have ovarian function. When you compare women who got zoldronic acid versus those who have not got zoldronic acid, there was a statistically significant difference in disease-free survival in these women who are made menopausal. When you combine all these various information, 
together, you see that in women who are postmenopausal, the Zofast trial did show some effect. In women who are postmenopausal, in the ASUR trial, there was significant improvement in disease-free survival. In women who were rendered postmenopausal, actually premenopausal younger women, in the ADCSG12 study, uh, there was a difference in uh, disease-free survival events. And then um, uh, we decided to launch the NSABP trial, which was conducted in our institution too, which is looking at Claudronate. Uh, it was called the NSABP B34 study. We looked at early stage breast cancer patients and randomized them into Claudronate versus placebo. After eight years of randomization, unfortunately, no difference in disease-free survival. But when you stratify them by age, patients more than 50 years, there was an improvement in disease-free survival in patients who were on Claudronate. No difference in women who are younger. This is the kaplan mayer plot in women who were older. And the distant metastasis-free interval is longer in women who were on Claudronate in the B34 trial. All right, that's a lot of various trial information, a lot of different study results, a lot of, uh, you know, substratified analysis, uh, non-pre-specified analysis. What do you do with this information? Third time I'm asking this question, the same answer, do a large meta-analysis. That's what they did again. This is the large individual participant data meta-analysis of all these trials, nearly 26 trials. It's conducted by the Oxford group called Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group. This is, in fact, the meta-analysis group that has brought remarkable changes or transformed the care of breast cancer worldwide. They brought tamoxifen. They brought the AI use. These are the guys who brought uh, chemotherapy for us. When I say they brought it, you know, they, they helped conduct formal, well-conducted meta-analysis and established standard of care. So they decided to address this question. This was a group of investigators worldwide who met in Oxford and meets regularly. So this included 18,000 women in 24 trials and had two core primary endpoints. One was breast cancer recurrence and the other was distant recurrence and had several pre-specified subgroup analysis. And what did we see? In women who were on bisphosphonates for adjuvant therapy, that's early stage breast cancer patients given bisphosphonates, that's the red, there was no difference in recurrence rate after a particular period of time. But the distant recurrence rate was improved with a p-value of 0 0.03. The bone-specific recurrence rate is improved, very statistically significant p-value, with a 7.8 percentage incidence of bone recurrence on bisphosphonate at year 10 as compared to 9 percentage. Breast cancer mortality, which is a very hard end point, is also significantly improved in uh, women who are postmenopausal. Well, this is all commerce, pre and postmenopausal, all commerce, sorry. So that's about 2% absolute difference, and actually uh, a relative risk of 0 0.91, statistically significant p value, non overlapping confidence intervals. And then the group decided to look at postmenopausal women to tease out how these differences came about. In postmenopausal women, there was a statistically significant p-value of 0 0.003 in distant recurrence in women who were on bisphosphonates. Bone recurrence, significant improvement in bone recurrence rate of about 2.9 percentage, absolute reduction of 2.9 percentage. But there was no difference in non-bone recurrence. So we would think that all these results, the distant recurrence rate is probably translated from the bone recurrence prevention because this does not seem to be a non-bone recurrence uh, identified. A subgroup analysis was done to see if there's any difference between amino versus non-amino bisphosphonate, that's claudronate versus zometa, zoledronic acid, and there was no difference, just used bisphosphonates. Different types, no difference between zoledronic acid, claudronate, ibandronate, pamidronate. More intensive schedule versus less, no difference, actually. Uh, whether hormone receptor status mattered? No, it did not matter. The only thing that was actually significant was the menopausal status. There was no effect on premenopausal women. There was a significant effect in postmenopausal women and age. 
This is the bone recurrence by menopausal status. As you can see, postmenopausal women have a significant improvement in recurrence rate as compared to premenopausal women. And stratified uh, breast cancer mortality is stratified by menopausal status. There was no difference in premenopausal women, but at least 3.3% uh, uh, absolute risk reduction for breast cancer mortality in postmenopausal women with any kind of bisphosphonate use in any kind of schedule. What do we learn? Bisphosphonate have an anti-cancer effect. There's an 18% reduction in death and a 33% reduction in bone metastasis in postmenopausal women. And what we know, the effect of bisphosphonates is primarily mediated via decreasing the incidence of bone metastasis. And that there's no effects on visceral or contralateral disease incidence. It again reiterates the importance of the soil, the tumor microenvironment. There's something that's happening in the tumor microenvironment with using bisphosphonates that's altering the uh, incidence of bone metastasis or distant metastasis. This is very significant research, quite important, dramatic research that we wrote the editorial for Lancet this past August and we recommended that bisphosphonates should lead to widespread adoption. Uh, these research should lead to widespread adoption of bisphosphonates in postmenopausal women in an adjuvant setting. And we compared it to similar results for chemotherapy. In a previous large EBC-TCG meta-analysis, they found that the absolute risk reduction for chemotherapy use versus no chemotherapy use is 3.3%, exactly the same that you get with using bisphosphonates, given that every patient got standard of care. So we are actually improving uh, outcomes in addition to standard of care by using bisphosphonate with the same measure that we are using uh, polychemotherapy. Now why is, this was extensively covered in newspapers worldwide, but why are we not using it as much as uh, we should probably? The companies are not interested. Drug companies have lost patent. They don't care about bisphosphonates anymore. They, there's better drugs coming out. Denosumab probably have better effects. This is an important drug that has a very important effect in a subset of population. Now, the fine aspect about bisphosphonates in terms of an adjuvant therapy, now the goal is disease recurrence reduction, right? Is to identify which patient benefits more. So what's my practice in my, my clinic? I use bisphosphonates in an adjuvant setting in women who have significant disease at get-go. Patients who have T3N2 disease, patients who have significant stage three disease, Patients who have osteopenia, right? If they have osteopenia already, that's another reason they should get bisphosphonate. So why not use it? Because it has another anti-cancer effect too. So this is, again, another caveat to the personalized care medicine dogma that you've got to look at a patient, understand the patient better, understand the tumor characteristics, and use drugs that are available in our arsenal. Now finally, back to my patients. Ms. S took letrozole for five years and Zomira for two years. That's four doses, six monthly. Her osteopenia improved. She's now disease free after seven years and bisphosphonate therapy may have helped maintain her BMD, may have prevented her disease recurrence. And the other patient with the metastatic disease never had any pathologic fractures during the course of metastatic disease to the bones. Now finally, quiz question for all of you. <laughs> Who's this, who are these guys? Okay, okay. This is a tougher one. I didn't know who this was, by the way. Okay, this is somebody named Brandon Robinson. Okay, I'll explain why his picture is here when I really don't know who that is. This guy, okay, he's the guru of breast cancer. Bernard Fisher, who saved thousands of women over the course of the last 30 years. Uh, he was a chairman of surgery in Pittsburgh. He basically helped establish that lumpectomy works and not every woman with breast cancer needs to have their entire breast chopped off. This guy? Huh? Great, William Osler, now, and him, John Travolta. What, what, what binds all of them together? They're all triple threats. He, these guys act, sings, dances. Well, I don't know what he does, but he's a muscle builder. He's won the Olympia, Mr. Olympia, seven times in a row, acts and knows how to govern or win elections. Bernard Fisher, teacher, educator, uh, researcher, likewise, William Osler, triple threats, right? 
Brandon Robinson is uh, one of the first guys in sports who got the title triple threat. He knew how to pass, how to run, and how to do something else, I forget. What do, other, what do football players do better, you know? How to, uh, <laughs> anyway, these are triple threats. Like these guys, bisphosphonate is a triple threat in breast cancer. It helps prevent bone loss in early stage breast cancer. It ha helps prevent and treat bone complications in metastatic disease and helps prevent breast cancer mortality in postmenopausal women. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions.